Ladies, ladies, what am I gonna do with you guys? You're killing me. <laughs> Come on. How about I set you up on the uh, out on the patio? Richard Gere is a talented Hollywood actor and film producer, Buddhist, and public figure. He is often perceived as a lucky man and a darling of fate, but if you look closely, you will see a great personality, an altruist, and a man who has been searching for his true self for many years. We have made this video to learn more about him. Richard Gere – How the Ladies' Man Lives and Where He Spends His Millions Richard Tiffany Gere was born on August 31, 1949 in a large American family of housewife Doris Ann and insurance agent Homer George Gere. Besides Richard, who was born the second, the Gears raised five children. The parents were educated but simple people and managed to give their children a happy childhood in the suburbs of New York. They tried to provide a balanced upbringing. There was room to communicate with nature because the family lived in a small rural town for creativity and sports. The future actor studied guitar with might and main, shown in the school drama club, and did gymnastics. After receiving a sports scholarship after graduation, he went to the University of Massachusetts to study philosophy and directing. At the same time, Gear dreamed of becoming a professional musician and saw himself as a world-famous trumpeter. These crazy dreams eventually prevented him from getting a degree. At first, he chased an opportunity to become a musician and then became interested in theater and dropped out of school. Finally settling in New York, Richard tried his hand at theatrical auditions and one day he was lucky. In 1975, after a series of minor characters, he got the main role in the play The Killer's Head. On stage, he was blindfolded all the time, playing a murderer sentenced to death which played into the hands of the young actor. At the time, he was extremely reserved and often got nervous, which hindered his skill. In this case, however, the audience heard only his voice, which literally mesmerized the crowd. The young actor was so talented that he was noticed by film producers. First, Gear appeared in such films as Report to the Commissioner, Looking for Mr. Goodbar, Days of Heaven, Blood Brothers, and Yanks. And then he got really lucky. The Hollywood handsome John Travolta refused the main role in the movie American Gigolo, and the job went to Gear with a fee of $35,000. Thanks to the role, he instantly gained a whole army of female fans. Not the least role in this was played by the fact that the actor had to act in some scenes completely naked. The image of the heartbreaker and the role of the lover boy was stuck to him, which over time began to weigh on him. Two years later, Richard was offered the lead role, and again, ironically, the one that Travolta refused. The film An Officer and a Gentleman was a great success and won two Emmy Academy Awards and was also recognized as one of the greatest romantic movies in history, according to the American Film Institute. Should have warned you scuzzy female types all about the Puget dudes. Those are the ones that say they're wearing a rubber, but there's barely a little hole bitten in the bottom of it. <laughs> then, Richard's filmography was replenished with the movies The Honorary Consul and Breathless. And in 1984, he starred in the gangster movie The Cotton Club, directed by Francis Ford Coppola, in which the actor performed several parts on the trumpet, reliving his youth. What is this, a kidnapping? <laughs> Would you like that? Because I think I'm up to it. <laughs> you do move me. I don't know why, but you do move me in unusual places. Surprisingly, with a brilliant cast, a venerable director, and a whole galaxy of prestigious awards, the film failed at the box office. This did not prevent Richard from getting two million for the role. Next came the historical film King David, the drama Power, the action movie Miles from Home, the thrillers No Mercy with a fee of 1.5 million, and Internal Affairs. The real fame came to gear when he approached the 40-year milestone. Richard didn't want to play at all in Pretty Woman, which was originally conceived as a drama. He didn't like the script, which was changed beyond recognition. He was tired of the roles that parasitized his heartthrob image, but his agent persuaded him to go to a meeting with the actress chosen for the main role, and Julia Roberts convinced him to agree. Experts still have trouble explaining the magic ingredient that made this trivial story a huge hit. Did you really say $100 an hour? Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you don't have any prior engagements, I'd be very pleased if you would accompany me into the hotel. 
With 14 million invested in production, worldwide box office was 463 million. Perhaps the reason is the chemistry that arose on the set between the performers of the main roles, because for the sake of a happy ending, the screenwriters had to rewrite the finale of the picture. Initially, Edward did not even consider climbing the stairs to Vivian like a prince from her sweet dreams. In the original story, the rich man pushed the girl out of the car, throwing money at her. That's how the movie was supposed to end. Gear himself dislikes Pretty Woman for many reasons and emphasizes this in interviews, so he was very pleased with the offer of the master of Japanese cinematography, Akiro Kurosawa, who gave him a small role in his anti-war film Rhapsody in August. On the set, Richard had to speak Japanese, which he did not know. He had to memorize the lines by heart. The director was very worried that he would not be able to pay the Hollywood star for the work, but Gear assured him that he would play for free. As a result, the director paid him a symbolic amount and also paid for flight tickets for Gear and even offered to buy tickets for his friends if they wanted to visit Japan. Such a friend was Cindy Crawford, who had been his wife for a year. One of the most beautiful couples of that time was formed back in 1988, and in 1991, the official wedding took place in Las Vegas. The ceremony was very modest. It was attended by only four witnesses, and the rings exchanged by the newlyweds were made out of chewing candy wrappers. Many consider the wedding in Las Vegas a bad sign, and perhaps there is some truth in that since the couple divorced in 1995. Gear and Crawford chose not to make a tragedy or a performance out of this event. It went quickly and quietly, after which everyone went their own way. Gear's path at that time led him to Tibet. He met the Dalai Lama and almost became a monk, but the actor had so much life energy that he didn't fit into the novice's secluded routine. Since then, he sympathized with Tibet with all his heart. Richard spoke passionately about the plight of the region wherever he could. At one of his political gatherings, he went completely wild, promising to fight the Chinese alone if Tibet wouldn't get protection. The speech caused a murmur in the room, and only one woman found the courage to turn the situation into a joke. She turned out to be American actress Carrie Lowell, the famous Bond girl from the movie License to Kill. Very soon, Lowell became Mr. Gear's second wife. In 2000, the couple had a son, whom they named Homer after his grandfather's. Meanwhile, Richard Gere's film career was on the rise. He managed to appear in such films as Final Analysis, in which he also acted as a producer and the band played on, Mr. Jones, First Night, Red Corner, and Primal Fear. For shooting in the detective movie Summersby and the drama Intersection, the actor received five and seven million, respectively. And in the action movie The Jackal, he co-starred with Bruce Willis. However, the guys didn't get along very well and they swore never to act together again. Give over, Preston. Who are you really looking for? A pro. Calls himself the Jackal. Oh, that fellow. <laughs> the mystery man. By the way, Gear could have played the main role in the movie, Die Hard, which he refused for some reason. Meanwhile, the creators of Pretty Woman decided to make money by resurrecting the duet of Richard Gere and Julia Roberts in the romantic movie Runaway Bride. The film was a success. It earned $300 million at the box office and brought Gear a fee of $13 million. Immediately after this movie, the actor flashed his dramatic talent in the role of a rich man who finds himself powerless in the face of his lover's illness and death. We are talking about the film Autumn in New York, where he co-starred with Winona Ryder. You've got the hiccups. Are you kidding? I would go with you in a heartbeat. <laughs> You're fabulous. Yeah? But, uh uh oh. Oh dear. It must be me. Then the depressive mystical thriller, The Mothman Prophecies, and the drama Unfaithful were released, which together brought 30 million to the actor's bank account. Another work of gear in the early thousands was the melodrama Dr. T and the Woman About a Gynecologist. To better prepare for the role, Richard took the opportunity when his wife gave birth to their son, he studied the work of the maternity ward. In 2002, the name of Richard Gere again rumbled around the world, and the occasion was the release of the musical film Chicago. I can be an awfully good sport. Good, you got that out of your system. Now listen, you mean just one thing to me. You call me when you got $5,000. The luxurious crime musical masterpiece astounded not only the audience but also the critics who nominated it for 13 Oscars. BAFTA, Golden Globe, and Grammy Awards 
could not ignore the movie either. They literally showered the creators and actors of the film with awards. Gear won the Golden Globe for Best Actor in a Comedy or Musical. And by the way, the role of the creative lawyer could have gone to actor Hugh Jackman, who refused it, which he later regretted very much. Interestingly enough, the first film adaptation of Chicago was supposed to be made back in the 70s with Frank Sinatra, Lisa Minnelli, and Goldie Hawn in the lead roles. In 2004, a remake of the Japanese romantic comedy Shall We Dance was released, where the actor rocked the dance floor with Jennifer Lopez and Susan Sarandon, with whom he was in a romantic relationship in the early 80s. Beverly, dance with me. I don't know how. Yeah, you do. No, yeah, you've been dancing with me for 19 years. The actor devoted the following years to the films that did not receive much praise. B Season, The Hoax, The Flock, I'm Not There, The Hunting Party, and Nights in Rodanthe. The next takeoff happened only in 2009 when the actor starred in the incredibly touching, kind and sad film Hachi, A Dog's Tale. Alright, come here, come here, come here, come here. <laughs> okay, it's alright. While sentimental viewers around the world were crying their eyes out, its worldwide box office totaled more than 50 million. After the biographical movie Amelia, the crime thrillers Brooklyn's Finest and The Double, as well as a documentary about one of the teachers of Buddhism, Brilliant Moon, the film Arbitrage was released, in which Gear again co-starred with Susan Sarandon. Her teacher was Mr. James. Mr. James said, world events all revolve around five things. M-O-N-E-Y. He was his freshman econ. <laughs> no, was a fifth grade econ. Richard Gere was nominated for a Golden Globe for his performance. In 2013, the marriage of Gere and Carrie Lowell broke up when the woman found out about her husband's affair with a TV presenter of Indian origin. The separation this time was a difficult ordeal for Richard. His wife attacked him with accusations and draconian financial claims. But soon, the man met a new love. By that time, the actor had two unsuccessful marriages and a whole series of relationships of varying degree of seriousness. Uma Thurman, Kim Bassinger, Priscilla Presley, Barbara Streisand, Diana Ross, and a dozen other Hollywood beauties dated him in different years. But it seems that now Gear has stopped in his search. At one of the film festivals, he met Alejandra Siva, a journalist and the daughter of a former manager of the Real Madrid Football Club. The 34-year age difference did not bother the mature Silver Fox at all. That's how he was nicknamed in Hollywood for his refusal to dye his gorgeous gray hair. And after three years of relationships, he led his beloved one down the aisle. A modest celebration took place in April 2018 in New York and gathered only a circle of the couple's closest friends. A year later, they had a son together, Alexander, and in 2020, another heir was born, whose name was not disclosed. Now, the actor can afford to stop thinking about money and choose roles exclusively to his liking. Recently, his filmography more and more often includes roles in the outsure and low-budget movies. Among them are the film anthology Movie 43, the dramas Time Out of Mind, the Benefactor, Norman, The Moderate Rise, and Tragic Fall of a New York Fixer, and Three Christs, the melodrama, the second best exotic Marigold Hotel, the thriller The Dinner, and the miniseries Mother, Father, Son. In January 2023, a comedy starring the actor, Maybe I Do, was released. Richard Gere's fortune is estimated at $120 million, which makes him one of the richest actors in the industry. He had advertising contracts with the Italian car brand Lancia, the Visa payment system, the brand of carbonated drinks Orangina, and others. He invested money in a small luxury hotel Bedford Post Inn, which is located in the suburbs of New York. Guests can meditate, do yoga, and enjoy delicious dishes made from organic produce from the hotel's own farm. Gear himself and his family live in a spacious mansion located just an hour's drive from Manhattan, which he spent $10 million to renovate in 2020. The total area of the residential parts is more than 8,600 square feet, which consists of seven comfortable bedrooms, living rooms, and a wine cellar. The couple also chose to buy a vacant plot with a swimming pool in the yard next door to expand their land to 34 acres. Experts estimate this transaction at 700000 Until 2020, Richard owned another residence in Pound Ridge for almost 35 years. He bought it for $1.5 million and managed to sell it for $24 million. 
Charming, spacious, colonial-style villa with an area of more than 10,000 square feet is complemented by a swimming pool and access to a pond. This deal was not the only one that Gear managed to profit from. He bought a luxury home in Southampton for only $6.5 million in 2006 and sold it for $36 million. Richard Gear also has urban real estate. Since 2016, he has owned an apartment in New York in the Gramercy Park area, worth a little more than $2 million. The property consists of two bedrooms and a living room, which the actor renovated and furnished according to his taste. It is reported that his friend, actor, and TV presenter Jimmy Fallon persuaded him to make this purchase. Until 2011, Gear had another apartment, which he owned for more than 20 years and sold for $2.6 million. Now, these spacious and bright apartments can be rented by anyone for $20,000 a month. Richard Gear is a committed Buddhist and a life lover. He desperately fights against injustice and stands for the restoration of peace. In addition to fighting for the freedom of Tibet, because of which he was banned from entering China for life, he is engaged in environmental health and human rights issues, supporting many humanitarian international campaigns. He is also outraged by current events, even auctioned off one of his cars to donate the proceeds to charity funds to help victims of the war in Ukraine. A 1999 Jaguar XK8 collector's convertible was sold for 31000 This gorgeous car has a 5-speed automatic transmission and an engine capacity of 4 liters. At the time of sale, the mileage was 31000 In everyday life, the actor was seen driving an Audi RS6. By his age, Richard Gere has received everything one could dream of. Three sons, a beloved and loving wife, fame, and wealth. It seems that the saying, a good deed is never lost, finds direct confirmation in his life path. His motto is, stop treating yourself like an afterthought. Eat delicious food, walk in the sunshine, jump in the ocean, say the truth like you're carrying in your heart like hidden treasure. Be silly, be kind, be weird, there's no time for anything else. Do you agree with Silver Fox's statement? Peter Dinklage, How Tyrion from Game of Thrones Lives and How Much He Earns Peter Hayden Dinklage was born on June 11, 1969 in Morristown, New Jersey, in an ordinary family. His mother, Diane, worked as a music teacher in elementary school, and his father, John Carl, was an insurance agent, but he was out of work for several months a year. The actor has German, Irish, and English blood in his veins. At the time of Peter's birth, the family was already raising a son, Jonathan. In early childhood, the future actor was diagnosed with a rare gene mutation, achondroplasia. This is a type of dwarfism in which the growth of limbs slows down. Although the head and body develop according to the norm, it is noteworthy that only Peter was diagnosed with this condition. The rest of the family members are absolutely healthy. At the age of five, the boy underwent surgery to straighten his legs, but doctors couldn't do more. In adolescence, Dinklage's height stopped at four feet five inches, while his weight was 77 pounds. Peter attended the Del Barton Catholic School for Boys. Because of his appearance, he was often bullied by his peers, and because of that, he became hot-tempered and unsociable. In an interview, Dinklage admitted that he managed to cope with the pressure of society thanks to his family, who taught him to accept himself. With age, the boy began to treat his condition with humor, which added to his confidence. In the fifth grade, Peter played the main role in the school production of The Velveteen Rabbit and received such a storm of applause that he decided to become an actor. After that, he participated in many productions until graduation. In his spare time, Dinklage developed his talent by performing puppet shows for neighbors with his older brother. By the way, Jonathan also had good acting skills, but his love for music prevailed and he became a professional violinist. An interesting fact is that Bruce Springsteen's manager lived next door to the Dinklages. The famous musician often rehearsed there and according to Peter's family, it was loud and they didn't like it at all. After graduating from high school in 1987, the actor enrolled at the Bennington Theatre College in Vermont, where he chose to major in playwriting. There the guy proved himself as a talented and hardworking student, as well as a wonderful friend. Peter spent his extracurricular time 
Like all ordinary students, at loud parties with alcohol and music, he even performed with his own punk band, Wizzy, where he played trumpet and was one of the singers. In memory of his care for youth, Dinklage has a noticeable scar along his face, which he received during one of his concerts, jumping on stage. In 1991, the young man graduated from college. After that, he and his best friend Ian Bell went to New York, where they planned to open a theater company. The guys didn't have much money, so they rented a cheap apartment in Brooklyn with a horde of rats and no heating. For a long time, Peter couldn't find a job, theater groups didn't hire him, and movie producers only offered him to play leprechauns or gnomes. He refused to take them on principle, since most of them mocked people with dwarfism. After numerous casting failures, Dinklage got a job at a data processing company, but the money he earned was barely enough to pay the rent. Peter admitted that at that time he could often afford only a pack of chips a day. In the end, the guys were evicted for non-payment, after which Peter had to ask friends for a place to stay. Soon Dinklage got lucky and received a role in an independent movie. In 1995, the aspiring actor made a screen debut in the comedy drama Living in Oblivion, where his partner on the set was Steve Buscemi who became his good friend. Do you know anyone who's had a dream with a dwarf in it? No! I don't even have dreams with dwarves in them. The only place I've seen dwarves in dreams is in stupid movies like this. In the film, Peter actually played himself, an actor who, due to dwarfism, is offered only stereotypical roles. However, despite the fact that Dinklage's acting received high reviews from critics, he couldn't find an agent. In 1996, Peter starred in Mickey Rourke's action movie, Bullet, but was not even listed in the official credits. In subsequent years, he only received minor roles in low-budget films, among which the most notable were Safe Men, Human Nature, Just a Kiss, 13 Moons, and the TV series Third Watch. In 2003, Dinklage appeared in the drama The Station Agent, where he was cast as a reclusive dwarf, doomed to endless ridicule by others. Really angry. About what? Being a dwarf. This role was a real breakthrough in his career and brought him many nominations for film awards, including the Screen Actors Guild Award for outstanding performance by a male actor in a leading role. In the same year, the actor starred in the Christmas comedy film Elf and in the drama Tiptoes, where his partners on the set were Gary Oldman, Matthew McConaughey, and Kate Beckinsale. Peter also appeared on the stage of the New York Public Theater, playing the titular role in Shakespeare's Richard III, which was his longtime dream. Subsequently, Dinklage performed in many more plays. His love of the theater played a crucial role in the actor's personal life. Back in the late 90s, he met a theater director, Erica Schmidt, and a strong friendship arose between the young people based on mutual interest in dramatic art. And over the years, it turned into love. In 2004, Peter proposed to his beloved, and a year later, the couple had a modest wedding. In 2005, Dinklage starred in the TV series Life As We Know It and Entourage, the drama The Baxter, the comedy surviving Eden, and in the drama Lassie, where he played an artist of a traveling circus. Then his filmography was replenished with the TV series Threshold and Nip Tuck, the romantic fantasy Penelope, and the crime drama Find Me Guilty, which also starred Vin Diesel. Despite the fact that the film failed at the box office, Peter's acting received high reviews from critics. In 2007, Dinklage played a mad scientist in the family fantasy Underdog, and also starred in the British comedy Death at a Funeral as Peter who appears at a funeral ceremony and declares that he was the lover of the deceased, demanding money from his relatives for silence. How do you think that makes me feel? No, I'll tell you how that makes me feel. It, cheap. Like a cheap slut. 
Don't you think I deserve something? The film became so popular that three years later, they made an American remake where Peter again played the same character, only with a different cast. In 2008, the actor appeared in the movie Chronicles of Narnia, Prince Caspian, where he played the dwarf Trumpkin. After the release of the film, critics unanimously stated that Dinklage failed to eliminate the stereotypical image, and he himself considered participation in this project a great disappointment. Then Peter's filmography was replenished with such works as the sitcom 30 Rock, the drama St. John of Las Vegas, the drama I Love You Too, the thriller The Last Rites of Ransom Pride, and the dark comedy Pete Smalls is Dead, where the man also acted as an executive producer. In 2011, Dinklage appeared in the romantic comedy drama A Little Bit of Heaven, as well as in the acclaimed series Game of Thrones, based on the series of novels, A Song of Ice and Fire by George Martin. What you see is a dwarf. If I had been born a peasant, they might have left me out in the woods to die. Alas, I was born a Lannister of Casterly Rock. Things are expected of me. It is noteworthy that Peter became the first approved actor who didn't even participate in the casting. In the series, Peter played Tyrion Lannister, nicknamed the Imp who led a rampant lifestyle. After the premiere of the first season, Dinklage's photo appeared on the cover of Rolling Stones, Playboy magazine called him a sexy man, and GQ awarded him the title of Stud of the Year 2011. The actor himself is skeptical about these titles, as he doesn't believe that in reality, women will be interested in people with dwarfism. Subsequently, Peter starred in seven more seasons of Game of Thrones, until 2019. In an interview, he admitted that when he got his hands on the script, he started reading it from the end to make sure that his character would live to see the last episode. At the same time, with each season, the popularity of his character only increased, and eventually he took second place in the ranking of the best characters of the series, second only to his on-screen sister, Cersei. At some point, I want to hear how a Night's Watch recruit became King of the North. As long as you tell me how a Lannister became hands of Daenerys Targaryen. Long and bloody tail. To be honest, I was drunk for most of it. By the way, Lena Headey, who played Cersei, is a longtime friend of Peter, and he advised the directors to invite her to the role. It's worth mentioning that among the actors of the series, Peter received the largest number of awards, four Emmys, a Golden Globe Award, a Saturn Award, and a Screen Actors Guild Award. And the New York Times called Peter Dinklage one of the eight actors who turned television into art. Game of Thrones has become the most successful HBO project of all time, as well as the most expensive in the fantasy genre. According to some reports, Peter's fee per episode was $150,000 in the first two seasons, $300,000 in the third and fourth seasons, half a million in the fifth and sixth seasons, and the last season brought him $1.1 million per episode. Thus, Dinklage's total income from filming in the series exceeded $30 million. In between Game of Thrones seasons, the actor participated in other projects, voicing cartoon characters Scrat's Continental Crack Up Part 2, Ice Age Continental Drift, Rick and Morty, and Angry Birds Movie 2. He also voiced Tyrion in the video game based on the series. In addition, Peter appeared in several films, in 2013, his filmography was replenished with the drama A Case of You and the comedy Nights of Badassdom. And in 2014, he appeared in the dramas Lowdown and The Angriest Man in Brooklyn, as well as the fantastic action movie X-Men Days of Future Past, where he played the evil scientist Boulevard Trask. By the time you see the need for my program, it'll be too late and you will have lost two wars in one lifetime. It's worth noting that Dinklage wanted to star in this film so much that he agreed to the role without even reading the script. His acting received high reviews from critics and he himself was nominated for the MTV Channel Award for Best Villain.
In 2015, Peter starred in the drama Taxi and in the fantastic comedy Pixels, which was criticized and was nominated for the Golden Raspberry Anti Award. In 2016, Dinklage, together with his business partner David Ginsberg, founded a film production company, Estuary Films. In the same year, his filmography was replenished with the comedy The Boss, and in the following year, he appeared in the detective Rememory, the dramas Three Christs and Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri, starring Francis McDormand and Woody Harrelson. You two boyfriend and girlfriend? Early stages, you know? Is that right? We had a couple dates. The latter picture received high reviews from critics, and the creators, along with the actors, received many awards, including two Oscars and four Golden Globes. Despite the fact that Peter himself didn't receive anything for his role, the audience noted his image as one of the most memorable. In 2018, the actor played the main role in the fantastic drama I Think We're Alone Now, and in the biographical film My Dinner with Hervé, which tells about the last days of the French actor Hervé Villachez. Being famous is like being drunk, except the whole world is drunk with you. By the way, in both films, Peter was also a producer. In the same year, Dinklage appeared as a giant dwarf in the superhero movie Avengers Infinity War, which became one of the highest grossing films in history. What happened here? You were supposed to protect us. Asgard was supposed to protect us! Asgard is destroyed. In 2019, Peter played a cameo role in the comedy Between Two Ferns, the movie. And next year he starred in the thriller, I Care A Lot. He also voiced one of the characters of the cartoon, The Crudes, A New Age. In 2021, Dinklage appeared in the title role in the musical, Serrano, based on the plot of the stage play of the same name, the script of which was written by his wife. Freak. <laughs> Is that it? Have you exhausted your dictionary of scorn? Interestingly enough, he literally begged Erica to choose him for this role, as he dreamed of singing on stage. However, unlike the original work, the disadvantage of the main character is not a huge nose, but a small stature. For his brilliant performance in the musical, Peter was nominated for a Golden Globe. Now Peter's acting career is still on the rise. In the summer of 2022, the comedy American Dreamer premiered, also the filming of the movies She Came To Me, The Toxic Avenger, and Brothers has already been completed. And The Hunger Games, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, and Hit Pig are at the stage of filming. To date, Dinklage's fortune is estimated at $25 million, which includes film royalties and advertising contracts. In 2017, Peter starred in an advertising short film of the beer brand Estrella Dam. And in 2018, he rapped in a commercial for Doritos and Mountain Dew with Morgan Freeman. The actor also advertised Cisco's The Network Intuitive. The funny thing is that Dinklage, having become famous, signed such a serious contract because at the beginning of his career, he was only offered the role of elves in Christmas advertising, which he refused. The celebrity carefully hides his personal life from the public. Peter doesn't have social media accounts and is very angry when paparazzi are watching his family. The media learned that in December 2011, his wife gave birth to his daughter, whose name they don't disclose. And in September 2017, another child appeared in the family, whose gender and name are also unknown. According to some reports, the children don't inherit their father's condition. Dinklage and his family lived in Manhattan for a long time, where he could often be seen walking his dog or riding a scooter. A few years ago, the couple moved to a country house with a huge garden, which Peter enjoys taking care of. But all this remains hidden from the cameras and the prying eyes of fans. The actor owns a Chrysler 300, which was designed specifically for his condition. For obvious reasons, he also orders custom-made outfits 
or buys clothes in children's stores. Dinklage has been a vegetarian since the age of 16. When he needed to eat meat on the set of Game of Thrones, instead of real meat, they used tofu or just fake food. Peter is also a member of several animal rights organizations. One, he voiced the video Face Your Food on behalf of PETA, promoting eating vegan food for ethical reasons. The actor was repeatedly asked if he, as a celebrity, wanted to represent the interests of people with dwarfism. Dinklage replied that even now, he doesn't always manage to put up with his condition. So it would be hypocritical to try to help people cope with something that he can't cope with himself. However, he still took advantage of his popularity to draw attention to one incident. In 2012, in his speech at the Golden Globe ceremony, he mentioned the actor with dwarfism, Martin Henderson, who was thrown by a drunk rugby player at a New Zealand bar. As a result of the fall, Henderson suffered spinal damage and eventually died of his injuries in 2016. Peter became world famous after the release of Game of Thrones, but his filmography is full of other outstanding works. What movie with Peter Dinklage do you like the most? If you like the video, leave a like and also subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss anything interesting.